Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of How Did We Not Know That? But more importantly, season three. Yay! Yay. We're finally here. (laughs) Yeah, it's been so long. I genuinely felt a little lost without the podcast. I miss it so much. (laughs) It really has felt like longer than three weeks. No, it really has. And it's also going to be our one year anniversary. That's right. By the time this episode is up. Yeah, because we launched like May 6th of last year. Wow, it's already been a year. I know. Can you believe it? Time flies. Anyways, as a treat for you guys sticking with us for the past year and season three, we are doing the (laughs) long-awaited topic yes. we we actually mentioned this topic in our very first episode yeah so it's been it's, it only took us a year <laughs> yeah it literally took me a year to finish the research but <laughs> um yeah today we are finally talking about the spanish-american war we're gonna cover everything from puerto rico cuba guam the philippines we got it all today so for those of you who have listened to us since episode one it's finally happening, so <laughs> get get hyped. <laughs> all right, Nat, just take it away. Yeah. It's all you. All right, so Spanish-American War. So beginning in 1492, Spain was the first <laughs> European nation to sail westward towards the Atlantic Ocean and colonize the nations of the Western Hemisphere. So at the height of the Spanish Empire, Spain's territory extended from Virginia on the eastern coast of the U.S. all the way south to Tierra del Fuego at the tip of South America. Although this excludes Brazil. And then (laughs) westward to California and even Alaska. And then... Additionally, it had island territories throughout the Pacific, including the Philippines. Um, However, by 1825, Spain had lost most of its territory and its empire had fallen into other hands. So the Spanish-American War, so this kind of like sets the stage. So Spain used to be this huge colonial power. And then now by the early 1800s, it's like not as strong and it's lost most of its territory. The Spanish-American War originated, actually, in Cuba's struggle for independence from Spain. So this began in February 1895. So Spain, yeah, so Cuba was a Spanish colony, and they wanted to become independent. Spain had use brutal repressive measures to stop the revolution, um, including putting many Cubans in concentration camps in order to isolate the rebels. And so American, yeah, American newspapers started covering like Cuba, Cuban, the Cuban revolution and Cuba's Mm -hmm. fight for independence. Um, But actually, like, these newspapers really started to sensationalize the events and kind of, they kind of... uh, They exacerbated it a little bit? Yeah, yeah, like, they exaggerated... Uh, uh, (laughs) I remember vaguely, didn't a newspaper print something like, uh, remember the main to hell with Spain? Because something, someone's ship got bombed or something. No, I think a ship exploded, but it wasn't the Spanish, but they media just acted like the Spanish did it to help exacerbate tensions between the U.S. and Spain. Yeah, no, that's actually, that's exactly correct. So, so basically, yeah, before I get into the USS Maine, yeah, that's basically what happens. But, (laughs) um, so we, they call, they end up calling this, like, exaggerated news. They call this yellow journalism. And so yellow journalism is, like, the original fake news. Um, so they're already, like, exaggerating what's going on in Cuba. And then, so the U.S. sends a ship to Cuba in order to, like, help, in order to protect the U.S. citizens in Cuba and also just, like, U.S. property and assets. And this ship is called the USS Maine. And 
For some reason, the USS Maine sinks in the Havana Harbor in February 1898. And still today, like, the cause is not entirely known. Like, it's still kind of unexplained why it sunk. Um, But basically, yeah, as soon as this happens, the U.S., like, Americans start freaking out, and, yeah, it's remember the main to hell with Spain, um, and people just are so angry, and newspapers are just going crazy with everything going on there. Um, so, at first, so at the time, the president is U.S. President William McKinley, so complete full circle since our first episode, so exciting. Um, yeah, so wow. at first, he was opposed to war with Spain. But then Americans are going crazy, like, we want to go to war. And so, on April 9th, Spain was like, you know what, we're going to sign an armistice with the Cuban rebels, and we're going to, like, try to set up an agreement where you guys will eventually, like, gain more, like, limited powers of self-government. But then Americans were so invested in Cuba's, like, independence that they were like, the U.S. Con- Congress soon drafted resolutions that declared Cuba's right to independence, and they like de- demanded the withdrawal of Spain's armed forces. And Congress even authorized the use of force by President McKinley. So, like, Spain was like, we'll come to a settlement, but the Americans were like, no, it's not good enough. Like, Cuba should be independent. Um, so... Mm-hmm. Spain is not happy with, like, how much the U.S. is getting involved in their territories. And so on April 24th, 1898, Spain declares war on the U.S. And the next day, the U.S. declares war on Spain. So now the Spanish-American War has begun. Wow. wow. (laughs) But, like, the war itself is really not that exciting. It's pretty much one-sided because Spain was not prepared for, like, an overseas war. Like, they were just really caught off guard. The U.S. decides to go towards the Philippines um, because, again, Spain has so many colonies around the world. So on May 1st, 1898, Commodore George Dewey leads a U.S. naval squadron into Manila Bay in the Philippines. And they, (laughs) they just, like, completely annihilate all the Spanish fleet. So they pretty much destroyed the entire Spanish fleet within two hours. And then they take a break. Wait, two hours? Yeah, so like two hours in, like Spain is pretty much like defeated. So but after two hours, they decide to like pause, take a quick break in order to order like a second breakfast for the crew. And then they return. (laughs) Oh, man. And just like, yeah, the Spain is defeated within hours um so this is known as like the (laughs) battle of manila bay so in total Mm -hmm. fewer than 10 american seamen were lost while spain lost over 270 um so then by august of that year manila was completely occupied by u.s troops and so now we're gonna switch to puerto rico so okay so philippines is captured by the u.s and then puerto rico It's super quick, just the U.S. meets, like, very little resistance. There's only seven deaths total, and they're able to secure the island by mid-August. So, another checkbox. So, we have Puerto Rico and the Philippines. Okay, I just have a quick question. Mm. While we are defeating the Spanish in their territories, are we claiming the territory? Yeah, so we'll get to that, like, after the war. Because, yeah, again, in this episode, like, yeah, I'm mostly focusing on what happens after the war. Um, mm. So, yeah, we're just gonna... I figured, because if it was just the war, I was like, oh, it's kind of <laughs> going quick. Yeah, we're like, okay, the end. No, yeah, like, the war itself is not going to be the meat of this episode. But, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, this next part is, like, actually one of my favorite stories ever um (laughs) and if you guys listen to my mini series on u.s territories in season oh my gosh was that season one One. it was season one Yeah, yeah season one um i did an episode about guam so I'm just going to give like a quick refresher because I did cover this and that. So go check it out if you want to hear more. But um, the U.S. really wasn't that interested in taking Guam. Like it was a Spanish territory, so they're like, might as well. And they're also like, if we want to like 
sees the Philippines, we're going to need to take this small island that's on the way towards the Philippines. Um, so in June 1898, the U.S. sends a ship in order to capture the island. And so they get there and they throw up their flags, like the American flags, to like send a signal, a warning signal to the, the Spanish. And they're like super confused because they were expecting the Spanish troops to like retaliate with violence and like just react in like a warlike manner. But nothing happens. They're just sitting there. <laughs> and then just a couple hours later, a Spanish boat like comes up to the ship and they're like, oh, so sorry for not responding. Like they thought this was just a polite greeting from the Americans. And the Americans are like, what the heck? Why? Oh, the Spanish wow. had been the Spanish who were stationed on the remote island of Guam didn't know that they were two months into the Spanish American War. So they literally just did not know they were at war with the U.S. Oh, so. wow. How would you know, though? Don't you need a letter? Doesn't yeah, and people it's, still communicate? Okay. Yeah, and like Guam is in the Pacific. It's very far from Spain and the U.S., so they're, they're just very secluded. So wow, they didn't know. That's honestly so funny, though. It's so funny. They're like, <laughs> oh, hello. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Americans are like, hello, we're here to fight you. And like Spain, uh, Spain is like... I'm sorry, what? <laughs> so, yeah, so once they, like, realize that they were enemies, the Americans give them a letter to give to the Spanish governor of Guam, and they tell them that they have 30 minutes to surrender. And so <laughs> the Spanish are just like, okay, I guess. Like, <laughs> So they just wow. surrender, and the island of Guam is handed over to the U.S. It, but it's wild because the Americans only stayed in Guam for about like 24 to 36 hours they didn't leave any Americans in charge of the island and like they even brought back like the flag that they had put down like they raised a U.S. (laughs) flag and they're like this is America and then they like wrap it up and take it back oh my Um, goodness this is the funniest war right Um, war's not funny but oh yeah just silly it's silly to hear how fast this all happened yeah it's actually crazy and so yeah, I really appreciate that story. Um, and so, yeah, so now, okay, just checkbox. We have Philippines, Puerto Rico, and now Guam. Finally, Cuba, because that's where this all started. Um, so in Cuba, U.S. Army members land on the east coast of Santiago. And so, okay, Jack, have you ever heard of, like, the Rough Riders? The Rough Riders, mm-hmm. Okay. No. I feel like I, there's so many, like, little, like, things we did about it in history class like in high school like the rough riders because it's just like a group of men u.s army men um one of them is theodore roosevelt and so they like storm the coast of santiago um and they're like hey we're here uh but yeah like theodore roosevelt and the other rough riders like the other army men like their story is very much like uh, like it's it's like retold so many times and they're like wow they were so brave and so manly and they came in and fought so valiantly and so then like later when Theodore Roosevelt becomes like president this is like um super important for his campaign and his image he's like yeah I went to Cuba and I fought on horseback um and so yeah um I just remember hearing about Rough Riders a lot and this is where they like get their name but anyway, huh. so, okay. yeah, they slowly advance into the city. They try to force Spain's fleet out of the harbor. And again, U.S. just easily defa- defeats um, Spain's naval squadron. And on July 17th, 1898, Spain surrenders to the U.S. And it ends a very brief but momentous war. Um, <laughs> like... Uh, yeah yeah because it literally it went yeah it went from april to july of the same year so it's super short i'm curious as to how spain held their colonial empire so long when it sounds like they weren't very prepared well anyone they had been like Oh, yeah, for sure. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say, like, they had been slowly, like, losing their territories to other nations. And so it was just kind of, like, one by one. Like, one territory hmm. would get taken away. And then they're like, oh, we don't... We're not powerful enough to maintain it. 
And yeah, like if you think about it, like they had colonies all over the world and then we yeah, just came like and quickly of, captured. Right, like all of South America, right? Most of it yeah. besides Brazil was also colonized by the Spanish. Yeah. So I'm just impressed or curious <laughs> as to how they about did why. that. I really don't mm-hmm. know the details of, like, why they became so weak and, like, what are the reasons. Mm-hmm. Like, why I wonder if so something's easy. going on in Spain, yeah, yeah, at the same time. Yeah, I think their domestic affairs are, like, not super great at the moment, which I'll kind of get into later, but I don't know too much about mm-hmm. that. Um, no, it's okay. But, yes, so on December 10th of 1898, the same year, the Treaty of Paris is signed, and so Spain renounces all claims to Cuba, and they cede Guam and Puerto Rico to the U.S. They give it to the U.S., and they transfer sovereignty over the Philippines to the U.S. for $20 million. So this is, like, kind of confusing because it's, like, a bunch of, like, different words. I don't know. Um, So basically, so Cuba is granted full independence. Like, Cuba is an independent nation, and this is kind of, I'm not going to cover much about Cuba after this just because there's so much else um that could be another episode but yeah so Cuba is independent um Guam and Puerto Rico are given to the U.S. basically when the U.S. won the war um it made Guam an official U.S. territory so to this day like Guamanians are U.S. citizens by birth however they can't vote for president and they have no voting representatives in Congress and again, you can learn more about that in my mini zone. Um, <laughs> and then, so Puerto Rico is also ceded to the U.S. So after the Treaty of Paris is signed, the U.S. formalizes its authority over the one million inhabitants of the island. In the first three decades of its rule, the government made like many efforts to Americanize Puerto Rico, including granting full citizenship to Puerto Ricans in 1917. They also at one point considered a measure that would make official uh, that it would make English its official language, but that doesn't go through. Um, however, uh-huh. later in the 1930s, a nationalist movement within Puerto Rico led by the Popular Democratic Party won wide support across the island and further U.S. assimilation was opposed. So in the 1930s, that's when they start clashing. Um, uh-huh. In 1948, Puerto Ricans were allowed to elect their own governor for the first time. And then in 1952, the U.S. Congress approved a new Puerto Rican constitution that made the island an autonomous U.S. commonwealth with its citizens retaining U.S. citizenship. So it's a lot of like complicated terminology and like very careful wording. Um, yeah. Are Puerto Ricans allowed to vote in the U.S. elections? They are not allowed to vote for a U.S. president, but they have their oh. own, like, they have their, they can vote for their own governors. They have a non-voting representative in Congress. Um, and so, actually, like, that's a good transition because movements for Puerto Rican statehood along with lesser movements for Puerto Rican independence, have been grow- like gaining a lot of supporters um, on the island, especially recently. So since 1967, there have been six non-binding referendums on changing Puerto Rico's status. So statehood has won the last three referendums, uh, including one on Election Day 2020. 52.5% of Puerto Ricans voted to... Um, become a state but again like it's just saying like do you want this like nothing really comes out of it it's just like kind of a yeah an opinion poll so like this is really exciting because in april of 2021 so within like the last few weeks the house of representatives has heard testimonies for two different bills so the first one is called puerto rico statehood admission act and the second is puerto rico self-determination act so the first one the statehood admission act it's pretty much like a final and binding up or down vote on statehood so congress would vote like should we let puerto rico become a a state and it's like yes or no the second one is a bit different basically 
delegates would be appointed, like Puerto Rican delegates would be appointed, and they would consider either, quote, statehood, independence, free association, or any option other than the current territorial argument, unquote. So basically, it's like where Congress is giving Puerto Ricans the power to decide, what do you want to do? Like, do you want to be independent? Mm -hmm. Do you want statehood? Um, And so Puerto Ricans are still, like, fairly divided on the issue. I think the majority are leaning towards statehood. There are still some people that want independence, but we'll see what comes out of this. Like, it's really exciting. Um, It's, like, it's a very complicated issue. Um, Right now, I don't know if people have been following the news, but, like, there are also, like, there's also a bill being debated about D.C., making Washington, D.C. the 51st state. So, like, that's exciting. But, like, in my opinion, I feel like that'll be a lot easier to pass than Puerto Rican statehood. Um, Yeah, I agree. Because uh, even when they had the hurricane, people didn't realize Puerto Rico was... Like, Puerto Ricans are American citizens as well. Yeah, like, they're Um, American citizens, but, yeah, after that hurricane, it was obvious that they're not receiving the same support as other Americans. Um, I don't know what the benefit of statehood is. Well, they could, they would be able to vote for president and then vote, have, like, a member of Congress that can vote on laws. So, like, right now, you're not allowed, like, you are affected by all the policies that the presidential, like, the president implements, but, like, you don't have a say over who your president is. Yeah, um, you don't have representation. And mm. then I think it has to do with funding. Um, yeah, and just, like, being represented. Because, yeah, like, after the hurricane, Puerto Rico really didn't receive a lot of support at all um, right. from the Do US. you know what the con is to receiving statehood because you said that Puerto Ricans seem to still be divided on the issue so what is the reason for not seeking statehood um I don't know like exactly but I know like there are movements for independence so like some people just like want to be their own country they're like if we agree to statehood then it's kind of giving up like your like independence would be almost like impossible after that um okay so I think there are some people that are still holding on to like, oh, should we just become an independent nation? But then other people are like, we're already, like we, <laughs> I don't know, if we join the U.S., if we become a state, it seems a lot more stable and like maybe just be, yeah, like more beneficial. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but either way, I think the status of Puerto Rico needs to be looked at, reviewed, and revised. Um, I think it's really important, too, that in this decision, like, Puerto Rico should be, Puerto Ricans should be the one to decide what they want to become, how they want to change its status, so. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I guess we'll have to keep our eye out for that. That's exciting. Exciting news, yeah. Exciting news. Okay, right. so last but definitely not least is the Philippines. When the Treaty of Paris is signed, Spain transfers sovereignty over the Philippines to the U.S. for $20 million. So basically the U.S. pays $20 million for control over the Philippines. Okay. I literally reacted like, oh my <laughs> gosh, $20 million? That's so expensive. But it's a country. For an entire so country. And I don't yeah. know what that is in today's money. That's like $20 million in 1898. <gasps> oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, they just buy the Philippines, which is... <sighs> um, yeah, and so... Filipino okay. insurgents who had fought against Spanish rule soon had to turn their guns to a new occupier. So, like, from the beginning of U.S. involvement in the Philippines, U.S. presidential administrations had assumed that the Philippines would eventually be granted full independence, and they kind of just considered their role on the island to be one of, like, preparing Filipinos to govern themselves through American-style democracy However, U.S. involvement in the, in the Philippines would last 
almost 50 years. So obviously it lasted a lot longer than anyone had expected. Um, and just like a side note, I don't think I would, I would put good money on the fact that like most Americans don't know that the Philippines used to be a U.S. colony. Like, I I did not know till last year and I don't remember how I learned that I think I watched a video on like Mm. why do we have so many Filipino nurses it was by Vox oh yeah yeah and then I realized that's when I found out that oh we actually owned the Philippines for some time yeah I yeah I would I think I learned about it last year too which is so sad because like I, I literally studied international relations like, I have a degree in that, and then I still did not know. I graduated college, and I still did not know that, like, the Philippines was a U.S. colony. So, I don't know if that says anything about education or, like, me, but <laughs> um, but I was reading the book, How to Hide an Empire, by Daniel Immervar. I'm pretty sure I mispronounced that. I'm sorry. Um, and then, yeah, he... It's an excellent book. I think everyone should read it I think all Americans should be required to read it because not only does it go through like the history of U.S. imperialism it also talks about why like Americans don't know anything about it today so yeah so anyway the Philippines what used to be a U.S. colony um and okay so the Spanish-American war ends and then the Philippine-American war quickly begins immediately after so the Philippine American War lasts from February 1899 to 1902. And actually 10 times more American troops died suppressing the revolts in the Philippines than compared to like the number of troops that died defeating Spain. So does that make sense? Like so we yes. like so many more lives were lost trying to maintain this colony rather than like yeah. fighting to then gain, gain it. it. Yeah. yeah. So that's wow. interesting. Um mm-hmm. So okay, so before the Spanish American War had even ended in June tw- on June 12th, 1898, Filipinos declared independence from Spain and they uh, proclaimed like a provisional republic and they chose General Emilio Aguinaldo as their president. That government had seized control over most of the Philippines' main island of Luzon. I hope I'm saying that right. And yeah, they established the Philippine Republic. But then the U.S. comes and they defeat Spain. And the U.S. gains control over Manila by mid-August of 1898. Um, However, like Filipino insurgents control the rest of the country. Because if you've ever seen a map of the Philippines, it's just a bunch of islands. So... Again, like, yeah. that's really hard to seize control over, like, an island, like, an archipelagic right. country like that. Um, right. And also just get the word out, too, with yeah. who <laughs> controls what. Literally, like, during this time, it must be so confusing um, to Filipinos. Like, just, you have so many different forces in the country. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, on February 4th, 1899, shooting erupts on the outskirts of Manila. And so while this fighting is in progress, General Aguinaldo declares war against the U.S. The Filipinos were quickly defeated by U.S. forces. Um, and the existence of Aguinaldo's government is pretty much completely ignored by the U.S. And even though the U.S. wasn't able to completely destroy Aguinaldo's government, they declared the rebellion officially over in November 1899. And the U.S. starts to just set up their own military commander and governor of the Philippines. So they're like, mm-hmm. if we just ignore the problem, maybe it'll go away, I guess. <laughs> I don't know why. Okay. Like, um, so while this is happening, while the U.S. is setting up their own little government in Manila, the Filipino insurgents flee and their government, they flee north. And so there's basically, like, two phases of this war. So the first phase of the Philippine-American War is at the beginning when General Aguinaldo tries to fight, like, a standard, like, war against the U.S., but he was really ill-equipped and unprepared. And so that's when they all, like, flee. U.S. captures Manila. They flee north. And then after this is when the war takes a turn 
and the Filipino insurgents switched to guerrilla warfare, um, which is a lot less conventional um, and rather like uh, instead of just like what you think of like standard warfare, like the 1800s, you know? Yeah. Um, so the U.S. wasn't able to set up like a proper functioning and effective stable government in Manila because they're so busy fighting Filipino guerrillas like all across the archipelago. The problem with guerrilla warfare, so basically guerrilla warfare, like you could think of it as like surprise attacks by people who are in civilian clothing and they're like hiding, they're using the, their like uh, terrain it's to their advantage. Yeah, yeah, their environment to their advantage. Um, the con of this is that the enemy doesn't like, the the U.S. doesn't know who their enemy is, you know? It, like, we see this in right. Vietnam with guerrilla warfare. They're like, I don't know who's a soldier and who's just a civilian. Yeah, so basically the U.S. is like, well, now we don't know who we can trust. So this leads to a retaliation campaign, including massacres, torture, burning of villages, and isolating what's called zones of protection, which is just another word for internment camps. So... Like, in some cases, they would literally just, like, blockade an entire town, an entire village, and they would just, like, starve them out until people would, like, confess who are the rebels. Starve them? Yeah. Starve them out. They would torture them and be like, all right, like, you have to give us, like, all your information. You have to give us your plans. Let us know, like, who the rebels are. Yeah. And, like, in the whole entire town, like, would just be stuck it it would just become an internment camp like it was awful Whoa! how did we not know that? yeah why did no one tell us this yeah it, there's so many like atrocities that were committed in the philippines especially if people want i don't have again like i don't have enough time to go into everything you can read more about it in how to hide an empire there's like so much that's covered but, like, one other just side note that people might want to research is U.S. treatment of Moro Filipinos. So, there's, like, a group of Muslim Filipinos called the Moros. Um, we, like, basically just rounded up, like, a thousand of them, brought them to this, like, extinct volcano, and just, like, massacred <gasps> no. them. Yeah, so... What? Yeah, so it, it gets really what? bad. Um yeah so (laughs) why did we do that what because it i guess that's how we thought like we're gonna gain control over the country and just yeah yeah that's what happens in imperialism but (sighs) um yeah uh so filipino okay i guess to like show the other side um like filipino fighters also like tortured captured american soldiers And they terrorized civilians who were cooperating with American forces. So, like, if there were certain villages that were, like, helping the U.S., then the Filipino insurgents would come and, like, burn down the village, too. So, it's, like, war is awful and terrible. terrible. Um, And, yeah, so, obviously, the U.S. had undeniable military advantages compared to the Philippines, The U.S. Mm -hmm. had trained fighting forces, they had a steady supply of military equipment, and they gained control over the archipelago's waterways. So, like, they controlled all the water routes. And then Filipino had... The Filipinos had many disadvantages. They were unable to gain outside support for their cause, so they were pretty much on their own. They just had a chronic shortage of weapons and ammunitions. Like, they... The problem was that, like, they would have guns. They're really old guns. But then they just didn't have any bullets. And so they were, like, trying to make their oh. own bullets. Sometimes they would just be fighting with, like, knives. Um, and again, like, people of all ages are fighting. Especially that's, like, in guerrilla warfare, a lot of time, like, children are recruited. So they would just have, like... Yeah. They would send, like, kids first with, like, knives and, like, improper weapons. Yeah, it's, like, really, it's really depressing. Um, This is horrible. I know, sorry. It's, like, yeah. I'm physically feeling, like, sad. Yeah. Physically feeling, starting to feel, like, uh, just so Um, sad with the whole thing. Yeah, it's really 
It's really awful, and I will, like, say, like, the book How to Hide an Empire obviously goes into more detail, but just a warning, like, the details are a lot more graphic and disturbing, um, but, I mean, it's what happened, like, it's the truth, it's history, yeah. so I, it's important to learn about it, but, yeah, it is really upsetting to mm-hmm. learn about, but, um, and back in the U.S., there's a lot of division over like whether or not the U.S. should be fighting this war in the Philippines. There are a lot of anti-war supporters, including Mark Twain, Jane Addams, and Andrew Carnegie. However, I will say, like, before you're like, oh, yeah, like, Americans are, like, standing up for the Filipinos. Basically, you have, like, your pro-war supporters and your anti-war supporters, but then the anti-war supporters are divided into two groups, basically. The first group of anti-war supporters are, like, yes, like, this war is morally wrong, and, like, we don't want the U.S. to become an imperialistic nation, like, we don't want colonies overseas. Then the second half is, like, we don't want to fight this war in the Philippines, because we don't want the Philippines to be a U.S. territory, but only because they're non-whites, like, we don't want non-whites to be part of the U.S. empire. So, again, you're, like, Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so it's really just like a very tiny group of ethical Americans. Yeah. And then. Yeah. yeah okay. So even the anti war supporters, it's not just like, oh, yay, like you're all, you have good morals. No, it's just like, we don't want non whites. <laughs> um, that checks out for the time period. Yeah, so exactly. Like, exactly. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so in March 1900, President McKinley convened the Second Philippine Commission in order to create a civilian government for the Philippines. So they want to transition from a military government to a civilian government. They're trying to like de-escalate conflict in the archipelago. And so William Howard Taft became civil governor in 1901, and he would later become U.S. president. So that's kind of wild that like... A U.S. president was like a governor in the Philippines territory, but on March twenty third, nineteen o one, General Emilio Aguinaldo is captured by U.S. forces, and the insurrection is ended. So the Philippine American War comes to an end. So casualties: twenty thousand Filipino combatants were killed, and um. 200,000 civilians died as a result of combat, cholera and malaria epidemics, and food shortages caused by severe, several agricultural catastrophes. So that's a huge number, like 200,000 people were lost. And 4,300 mm. Americans were killed in the Philippines. 1,500 Americans were killed in combat, combat, while the rest were actually killed from disease because they were not used to like the climate. So then the Philippine American War is over. The Philippines is still an American colony. So when does the Philippines eventually become independent? So that's a great question, Jack. <laughs> that's a perfect transition <laughs> to the next part. Um, so in 1916, Woodrow Wilson is president and he starts to turn over some authority to Filipino leaders. They This kind of begins the process of granting like, more and more self-governance to the Philippines. Um, like, they're allowed to form a Senate, and then, like, slowly they're gaining more, like, autonomy over the next, like, cu- couple decades. But then all of this is put on hold during World War II, because during World War II, Japan occupies the Philippines. So oh, wow. another occupying force enters, um, and so the U.S., so, okay, so I'm going to focus now on the Battle for Manila, which happens in February 1945. So Manila was considered one of the most beautiful cities in the entire world. Um, unfortunately, it was completely destroyed in a single month. Um, so from 1941 to 1945, the Philippines had been overrun by Japanese forces, and like, if you know anything about like Japan, World War II, basically they had occupied like all of Southeast Asia, but in other countries in Southeast Asia, um, it was pretty much like Japan fighting, um, like the inhabitants of that country, like the citizens of that country. 
the Philippines was really the oh. only Southeast Asian country where Japanese and allied forces were colliding. Um, so, because oh, okay. we had, like, U.S. troops in the Philippines. So, it wasn't just, like, oh, Japan is, like, trying to fight Filipinos. It was, like, okay, we're fighting Filipinos and American troops. Um, wow. And so, in this battle, like, the entire city of Manila is just bombed and, like, destroyed like, turned into rubble, which is really sad. An estimated 100,000 Filipino citizens die in this battle, which in all of World War II, only the battles of Berlin and Stalingrad resulted in more civilian casualties. So this is, like, a wow. huge uh, battle between the Japanese and then U.S. Filipino troops. Um, wow. And so, obviously... Japan surrenders at the end of World War II. And after this, I guess at this point, so we were like fighting the Japanese so hard in the Philippines because we're like, well, this is our territory. Um, But then after this, we're kind of like, you know what? Like maybe overseas territories are more of a liability than a benefit, you know? Um, And so on July 4th, 1946, the U.S. and the Philippines signed the Treaty of Manila, which officially grants full independence to the Philippines. So after World War II, we're like, okay, we're actually, like, this time it's for real. You guys can be independent. So mm-hmm. the their long and bloody struggle for independence from at first Spain, then the U.S., and then later Japan left Filipinos with a strong sense of national identity through their shared experiences and beliefs, people came to consider themselves Filipinos first and only. And mm. um, obviously, American occupation left like so many long-lasting effects. The, yeah, the impact of American occupation is like still the effects of <laughs> Jeez, Louise. the effects of you American go. occupation is like still seen today in the, in the Philippines. We left so many, like, long-lasting um, effects. Um, and so some... So Filipino historians argue that American colonial policies supported traditional elites and feudal social relations that continue to form the basis of today's oligarchy. So if you know anything about, like, Filipino politics, there is definitely lots of corruption in the Philippines um, today. And a lot of people see that stem from how the U.S. set up its own government in the Philippines mm-hmm. and then how they um, aided later, like, how, like when they're granting all this autonomy to the Philippines and, like, helping them set up their own governments. I think it definitely mm-hmm. kind of helped with, like, create this oligarchy that still okay. lasted today. And just, like, a lot of people, like, historians who look back on the Philippine-American War, the kind of what we were saying earlier, like, they think that Aguinaldo, General Aguinaldo's attempts to fight a conventional war in the first few months, like, led to his defeat. They were pretty much, like, because we, right at the beginning, they suffered severe losses in men and material and then they switched to guerrilla tactics later, but it might have been more effective if they had just started using guerrilla warfare from the beginning. Um, mm. uh, yeah, okay, so just to wrap up this long episode, um, the impact of the Spanish-American War. So, like, for yeah. first, like, kind of go back because we derailed a little bit, but the Spanish-American War is obviously an important turning point for both Spain and the U.S. So Spain's defeat turns the nation's attention away from its overseas colonies towards its domestic needs. And this actually leads to both a cultural and literary renaissance and two decades of much needed economic development in Spain. So they were like, you know what? Yeah, we should kind of figure out what's going on back home. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And then the U.S. emerges from the Spanish-American War as a world power with overseas possessions. They're an imperial power, and they have a new stake in international politics. Secretary of State John Hay called the Spanish-American War a, quote, splendid little war, unquote. And so, like, Americans were just like, 
oh, look at we defeated Spain, like this colonial power. We defeated them so easily. Like we had a huge ego boost after this war, um, yeah. which is like, that's kind of why we would later play a determining role in the affairs of Europe and the rest of the world. We've really come a long way since the War of 1812. Yes, yes. Oh my gosh. It's wild. Wow. The McKinley administration uses the Spanish-American War as a pretext for the annexation of Hawaii because that had oh. been, yeah, that had been, at first Grover Cleveland in 1893, he rejected requests from, like, businessmen in Hawaii. They were like, make it a state, because it's all, like, white businessmen in Hawaii yeah. that, like, overtook the island. And then Grover Cleveland was like, no, I don't know if that's, like, constitutional. And then later, McKinley, in August, on August 12th, 1898, Congress makes Hawaii a U.S. territory. Wow, And yeah, it was because of, like, our success in the Spanish-American War and all of our territorial acquisitions yeah Yeah. we're like let's give this imperialism a try yeah they're like man this is nice (laughs) yikes um (laughs) so that's that's the spanish american war finally so many things happen from this tiny little war like so many things came from it and again i didn't even talk about cuba that's for another time (laughs) i'm just gonna keep dragging it up yeah, I feel like we just dabbled. Wow, it. I, I'm. <laughs> I think you did a great job. I'm. This was. I know we waited a year for it, but I feel like it was really worth the wait. You did a fantastic oh, job on research. You. I loved thank the you. pacing. I loved how you organized it. Just thank overall, you. probably one of my favorite episodes. This beat out the Rasputin episode, which I love that episode. Oh my too. gosh, that was a fun one. This one is just like, uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's just so crazy, and I really don't know. Like, how did we not know that? Like, this is such an yeah. important event for so many I places never all around the world. Right. And, like, again, like, when you talk about, like, things that are on the news today, like Puerto Rico, Puerto Rican statehood, even, like, Guamanian independence, like, that all stems from this. And so, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's wild. Wow. Incredible. Yeah, I'm glad you it. Yay. Yeah. So season three, we're coming in strong. I'm so excited for all the topics we're gonna cover. So please everyone stay tuned. We're so happy to be back. And yeah, I guess we'll see you all in the next episode. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>